thank you for inviting me to come all the way out here from home, which is a quite a long way away in Queens. <laughs> I come to Baldwin quite often because my favorite cousin lives probably about 10 minutes away from here. So I don't need any excuse to be invited to Baldwin. I say that to say, please invite me again. Now you might think differently after the sermon. I hope not. Uh, so let's pray for, it, for what comes out of my mouth so that maybe I'll get another invitation. And so, Father God, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you do day in, day out, night in, night out, to advance your kingdom, to make yourself known to the world, and even to us here in Baldwin. Uh, thank you for, for new relationships and old relationships. Uh, those that have passed and those are, that are yet to come. We pray that you will continue to establish your kingdom right here in this place. We pray that you bless the speaker, that he becomes small, and uh, you become magnanimous in the eyes of those who are here. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I, um, as I said, I am here at your invitation, and um, my first impression, for whatever it's worth, I think I should share that with you. My first impression was made by Tom, and so uh, I like him. <laughs> and that means that by projection, I'm sure that I will like you. But I'm not sure that you will like me. I will say that Tom seems to like me. And so if that's any endorsement, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here with you. So, I also have to be truthful with you and say that I've preached this sermon, uh, this is the third time preaching, the first time obviously to you, um, but my third time preaching this sermon, now it's become kind of a thesis sermon, I don't know why, maybe it's because it's a season of life that I'm in, um, and I, I will get to know a little bit more about why, what season I'm in. Maybe right now I'll tell you that uh, I am the father of three young adults. Uh, I'll tell you that two of them have birthdays coming up in November, so they, they all will be uh, 22, 23, and 24. They're all girls or young women. Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> explain the hair loss <laughs> that happened before they came along. Uh, no, I would say that they are they're the crowns in my life. And, and the, the biggest jewel in that crown is my wife, Vanessa, 26 years, whom I met uh, 27 years ago. Uh, it took us only about three months. Well, it took me about three weeks to be convinced that she might be my wife. It took her about three months to even entertain the idea. And it took us 11 months to put a ring on it. So we've been together 26 years. I hope that you get to meet her too. Um, I have been in ministry since that time. Uh, I met her because we were, being, we were planting churches. So I met her in Jamaica, then I went to Guyana where I was born. We led a church there until uh, Vanessa unfortunately became very, very ill. And then uh, we had to come back to the U.S. Since that time, God has used us in a strange ministry way. Uh, I have not pastored a church or been in a pastoral role since that time, but we've been doing ministry all along for most of that time in a very strange way, where God has called us periodically to come alongside churches, come alongside leaders, and be a friend, a friend with some insight, a friend to the pastor who might be able to offer some, some perspective, and God has continued to grow that in a lot of different ways in a range of countries and uh, mostly now in the United States and across a, a range of denominations. Uh, I never envisioned that that's how God would use me, but I would not change a single thing about it because I've been able to make, uh, we've been able to make friends just in, in just every place that we could imagine. So thank you for now including me in, in your life, at least for the next uh, Tom, did you say an hour and a half? <laughs> okay, I'll shorten it. A little bit. Just a little bit. 
So I thought I would bring you good news. Speaking of the hour and a half, I will tell you that the sermon's title is It Is Finished. <laughs> <laughs> Which means uh, I plan on completing the task today uh, as Jesus did just about 2,000 years ago. So the scripture I'll read with you is probably very familiar to you, um, although I, I, I regret that I did not ask you which uh, version you would prefer. So I'll take that reading from the New American Standard Version, but you can read from any version that you would prefer. It's almost the same thing. John 19, 28 to 29 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished in order that the scripture would be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a branch of his heart and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay. So, uh, this, yeah, I believe this is very, very familiar to you, whether in this gospel or, or any of the others. This, uh, this, this, Close of the act, if, you're, if you, you, you love plays, this could have been the final act, right? This could have been curtains and ovation, but we know there's more to the story than that. You know, there was another chapter. But at this point, if you were standing there witnessing this at, at the cross, you would have thought that it is finished meant curtains is over. And see. And you, being a follower of Jesus, if you were at the time, would have been, I don't know, disheartened at least, disappointed, dismayed. I mean, these other words that have uh, dis as their prefix. And who could blame you? You would have invested at least three years of your life. His mother was at the cross. So in her case, 33 years of her life. In her case, there was a prophecy. Uh, you know, remember the, the immaculate birth, the idea? That she, she gave all of that, believing that there would be a different outcome. She couldn't see the future. All she could hear in her head was, it is finished. What she would have seen was her body, the body of her son, disfigured in front of her on a cross. And what she would have seen was the last indignity, which would have been him being handed, not handed, offered sour wine on a branch with a sponge, and she would have known that would, would, would not have been in response to him saying, I'm thirsty, in such a way as to, to provide for him or to, to, to quench his thirst. That would have been a way to, fight, to, to lay the final indignity upon him. The bitterness and the sourness, the bitterness of the hyssop mixed with the sourness of the wine and the, symbol, the symbolization of it, which meant that even in his dying moments, he was mocked. And she would have stood and witnessed this and heard it is finished. And like any good mother, I would venture to say she breathed a sigh of relief. And what a moment would that have been for a mother to breathe a sigh of relief at the death of her son. But she would have also uh, viewed and witnessed the abuse of her son. She would have witnessed the indignity. So when she heard, it is finished, I can imagine as many emotions as she must have felt, there must have been a sense of relief. Curtains. End of act. End of play. Okay, let me segue to something here and talk about something that 
I know has been on your mind, and certainly has been on my mind, which is the national debt. And if you've ever seen the national debt clock, it is a billboard size clock that shows the U.S. debt. And of course, you can imagine the, the, the great number of $30 trillion has, for the most part, continued to increase. Well, it's in, in Manhattan. You, you're welcome to go, to go see it. Uh, it. It is revealing. Uh, it was placed there by uh, Seymour Durst, a New York real estate developer, who wanted to highlight the rising national debt. Durst said in 2016 that the clock was a nonpartisan effort to, to think about intergenerational equity, he said. He says, we're a family business. We think generationally. We don't want to see the next generation crippled by this burden. So his effort was to, to remind the people that there is such a thing as a debt and it's mounting and mounting and the number grows and $30 trillion. And when, I, when I last checked, when I wrote this sermon quite a while ago, it was $30 trillion. I'm sure it is more than that now. But it averages out to about $92,000 per U.S. citizen. Meaning to say that your child or your grandchild that was just born just inherited $92,000 in debt, just by becoming a U.S. citizen. Now, how do they pay that debt? We pay that debt in many ways. Pay that debt in ways we're taxed. We pay that debt in what is available to us as citizenry and what is not available to us. In other words, that debt is with us whether we want it or not. Well, that's not necessarily good news to you, so I better get around to giving you because I started with the fact that Jesus laid down his life on that cross. And then I started with what his mother must have felt and other observers must have felt. And then I went to something that we all can relate to, which is the idea of this growing debt. But here's the good news. When Jesus said it was finished, he didn't say it was over. He was using an accounting term that we translate into it is finished. And the term means it is paid in full. This is the final judgment. This is a declaration. Okay, how, how does that make sense to me when I think about this? I remember, and I, I must say this is a long time ago, a long time ago, I got my driver's license suspended. Did I say a long time ago? Quite a while ago. I was less than half, more than half my age ago. And I, I had accumulated some, uh, some parking tickets parking that I could not pay. And then I got a few moving violations that I could not pay. And I thought, eh, I'll get to it when I can get some money. I was an undergrad at the time. And lo and behold, they must have sent me a notice that my driver's license was suspended, but eh, it was in the mail. I didn't see it. Maybe. And I ignored it. Until when I had to deal with that. When I had to register my car the next time, they required that I have a driver's license. A, <laughs> an active driver's license. And I realized that debt had been mounting because of all of the interest. And the penalties. And if I did not come up with that money, I could no longer use my car. And that's when it occurred to me, I really need my car. So I had to figure out how to pay that debt. Well, however it is that I figured it out, oh, by the way, let me just let you know, I do have an active legal driver's license. Uh, I figured out how to pay that debt. And I didn't realize how relieved I would feel when I heard the the person at the DMV declared to me that the debt was paid off and that I was eligible to reapply for a driver's license. That was a big point in my life. So Jesus would have used the same term with the same authority when he said, it is finished. It meant that the debt was paid off. 
and that I would, I would no longer have to worry about penalties or accrued further debt. And, and the privileges that I would not have had because I had this debt are now extended to me again. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. It is finished did not mean it was over. It is finished means that it begins for us today. That our debt, our sin debt, the debt that we owe from the moment we come into the world, the debt that is upon us, the intergenerational debt, the things that have been passed on to us that will happen to influence us and the influence we will have on other people. Jesus took all of that in our place. So today, as believers, we live in a time that in the Old Testament we refer to as a jubilee. And if you're familiar with what a jubilee is, you would know that it's a time of celebration. The jubilee was a time where, in ancient cultures, and then it was adopted into, into the Jewish system, would wipe out a period of debt, an accrued debt. So it was a time where slaves were set free. It was a time where property was restored. So if, if your property was given as collateral for something, during the time of Jubilee, that property was restored back to your family. It was a time of healing. It was a time that gave people an opportunity to move forward without the burden of their debt. In our case, in the, sin, in the case of the sin debt that we owe, there was only one person throughout history that could wipe out that debt. So up until the time that Jesus said it was finished, every person still owed a debt. And every child born into the world was still born into the sin that they inherited and then would later pass on and be a part of it. It was a mess. And Jesus' death on the cross erased all of that so that we could have a new life in him. And no one could do that but Jesus. Before the arrest of Jesus, by the Romans, Jesus prayed his last public prayer. Here's what he said. He asked his father to glorify him as he had glorified the father. And he prayed, finish the work you had given me to do. This is in the book of John. Finish the work, which was the work in him, that you had given me to do. The work Jesus, of Jesus was to seek and save what was lost, as in Luke 19.10, and to provide atonement for sinners who Jesus later died for to restore them to God. The work of Jesus, we use this term atonement, it is the same, it is the same as this idea of it is finished. The, the, the paying off of the debt. So, imagine the 13 year old Jesus then who walked into the temple and read from the scriptures in Isaiah this idea that he would be setting the captives free. And he goes, he walks in at 13 year old. Some of you might have 13 year old children or near or grandchildren. Imagine hearing that out of the mouths of one of your 13 year olds. I have come to set the captives free. You might be astonished. But this is what Jesus did. His first words of ministry is as far as I see it. So none but Jesus could do that. It is finished. The work of Jesus paid that debt. Therefore, we are now in a debt-free grace period. You get the clever use of the word grace there? We are in a debt-free grace period. Yes, me and you. What does that mean? It means then that Jesus 
having paid that debt, and us having surrendered our lives to him, there's still an accounting going on, right? He paid off the debt, but we now surrendered, gave ourselves to him, so now he becomes Lord and Master. We are now obligated in a different way. But it's a celebration. It's a celebration. The Jubilee is a time of celebration. It's a time of collective forgiveness of all debt. Freedom for everyone. In the, in the Near East, in the ancient Near East, it was a common practice among some kings. We see it mentioned in the Bible. But the type of debt relief we're talking about, only God can give. Only God can give forgiveness of sin. Perpetual forgiveness, not just a one-time thing. But continued forgiveness of sin. If you want to know more about the Jubilee, uh, read the book of Le Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus 25. And if you're wondering why I have not yet outlined point by point in the sermon, it's because there's... So, so working in me is a little bit of a teacher as well as a, as a preacher. Um, in fact, officially tomorrow, uh, I, if everything goes well, you can pray about this, I'll be accepting a professorship at Berkeley School of Theology. Um, and I've been, I've been affiliated with, with a, a range of theology schools and things going forward, but this is a big deal to me, so would you pray about that for me? It's a big, really, really big deal. So, I, I didn't want to go point by point by point by point. I wanted to establish the big picture. Did I do a good enough job of that for you? Yes. Right? And it's a familiar picture. You've looked at this picture before if you're a believer. Right? None of us are here without the understanding that Jesus died for our sins. It's a fundamental truth. But haven't you had the experience of having a fundamental truth be presented to you in a different way where it actually opened your eyes to something that you did not see or something you forgot. So I started this sermon with the assumption that I might have that effect. That I might be preaching the same old message that you might have heard for 30 some odd years and maybe the Holy Spirit today is going to point you to something that you either did not know or might have forgotten. And if that happens, would you let me know? I'm going to stand back there and greet and say thank you at the end of the sermon. And it's affirming to me that somehow God used us to, together in this moment today to reestablish something that is so important to him. And if you don't get an opportunity to share with me, share with somebody else. Share the gospel with somebody else. That it's really this simple. So that's what I'm trying to establish here. So Jesus, in his first opportunity to preach the word, opened the scroll, and here's what he, he, he read from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and to recover sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. The favorable year of the Lord is another way of saying the Jubilee. The sermon was then recalled in Luke 7 when Jesus was responding to John the Baptist's disciples about whether he was the one who was to come. And then Jesus tells them the, the, essentially the Jubilee story about that forgiveness. Luke even makes it clear that in the Our Father prayer that we pray, that that prayer includes <coughs> forgive us our debts as we forgive those for our debtors. And that the coming kingdom of God was to, that the kingdom of God was to come on earth. So this is an important theme. So when, it, when Jesus says it is finished, He's establishing that in him the promises of God will be fulfilled. All of the promises of God will be fulfilled.
in that moment on the cross. Even as he was being handed the sour wine to quench his thirst. So today, in part B of this sermon, I'm going to share with you benefits. So, not only have your sins been forgiven, but there's some more benefits. Point number one, one benefit, is that in this jubilee, in this time of jubilee, we have been reconciled to God. We have been brought into a healthy, enduring, loving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So if you read Romans 5, 6 through 11, it reads this way from the New American Standard. For a while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If then, if then, past and present and future, all captured here, the time before our, our, our saving by Jesus on the cross, we were enemies of God. The time after, we are no longer enemies, we are friends, we are, the Bible says we're sons and daughters of God. There is this point of no return on the cross. It is a big paradigm shift because of what Jesus said. And what, what, what Paul is saying is that God is so good. Somebody should say, how good is he? Somebody try to say, God is so good. <laughs> He's so good that he reconciled us to him even when we were his enemies. In other words, we didn't have to clean up our act so that God could come and be our friend. Paul is saying, you want to know how good God is? He did this while we were still sinners. I don't know about you. That kind of message is pretty humble. Because I don't know about you, I'm still a sinner. The real change in me isn't, the, isn't that I stopped sinning once I became a believer. Although Paul admonishes me that I should sin a whole lot less. But here's how the accounting works. I can't count my sin before, and I can't count my sin after. The numbers are too great. That's why Jesus is so awesome. Not counting men's sins against them. Neither before nor after. Reconciliation, another accounting term, right? It's putting it in balance. Where things are not in balance, where the scales are not in balance, my debt is great. God's grace is greater. So now I'm in a reconciled relationship with God. That is one of the benefits of us being reconciled to God. My favorite prefix is anything in the Bible beginning with R-E or any biblical principle that has the R-E pre uh, uh, a prefix. R-E means anew, again, doing something over. So restitution, for example, the idea of Jesus paying for my sin is an act of restitution. It's restoring what was lost. Restoration, another RE prefix, the action of returning something to a former owner, to a former place or former condition. Jesus returned me and you to what God intended us to be. Restoration also means to bring back, to bring something back, 
to the way the maker intended it. I love restored furniture because I, I, I got into the age now and you don't even realize that you cross these age thresholds. I just did. Like I walked into, it happened to me about, let's call it about 10 years ago, and I remember the moment. So I walked into a CVS, and I walked up to the counter, and I put my, whatever it is I had purchased on the counter. The woman behind the counter seemed older than me. I don't know if she was, but she, she called me sir. And I heard it differently for the first time. Does that happen to you? And you realize, wait a minute, I'm not 28-year-old Ryan, whether I think I am or not. And you cross this threshold. And then you look back in a reminiscing way to the time when you were younger. You know, in my case, 40 pounds lighter. And I realized, that ain't gonna happen again. You realize you cross a threshold. Restoration of furniture reminds me of that. I like restored furniture because I am of the age now where I say they don't make it like they used to. Have you said that? Then you cross the threshold, folks. That's a sign. There's no turning back for you now. I say they don't make furniture like they used to. So my wife is into a particular period of furniture. If you come up to my house and you're welcome to, you will see that, that, that our furniture is, is of a particular period or a particular style. And most often than not, she cannot, she doesn't like the, the stuff that is made to look like that. So she'll buy older furniture from that period and then have it restored. So my, in my home, there's restored furniture. But I love it because the quality and the craftsmanship of that period is then reflected without some of the wear and things and it's restored. Now imagine that that may be what Jesus is doing with us in this period. Restoring us to what? To what God intended for humanity in the first place. Despite our sin. He is restoring you to what God intended for us and him together despite our sin. Now, that message may not resonate to, as much to the 28-year-old Brian to, as the 54-year-old Brian or the 74-year-old you. Because as we get older, we certainly don't feel like we're being restored. I and mean, I should speak for myself. <laughs> However, as we get older in Christ, there's this work that he's been doing in us all along where Christ is reflected more in us and we are reflected less. That's the restoring work of the Holy Spirit. And then there's reconciliation. Reconciliation is this idea of putting together what has been broken, restoring friendly relations. So you imagine two nations that have been at war for a long time and there is a period or a, a goal of reconciliation and that reconciliation is, is, the, is the restoration of a friendship, of a bond, of kinship, as it were. Reconciliation. So all of these things are the benefits. The next benefit, the next point that I'll make is that we also get a ministry of reconciliation. Not only do we get restored to a relationship with God, but we also get a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we become ambassadors, use that word. We become ambassadors of reconciliation. This idea is captured in the book of John, in John 14. The words of Jesus, truly I say to you, the one who believes in me, the work I do, he will do also. And greater things than these he will do, because I'm going to the Father. And whenever you ask, and whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's go back, because a lot of people land on that last part, and they miss what comes before that. What comes before that is the things that I will do, you, the things that I have done, you will do greater things. 
And I don't know about you, but I can tell you about me, I have a tough time believing that part. That in, in my life, I will do things that he says will be greater than he has done. But that's in the red letters in some of our Bibles. So what is he really saying? Now you here is collective and individual. So if I say, if I address you as you, I'm addressing you as a congregation. But if we're having a personal conversation, I can address you as you as well. Jesus uses that in the very same way. We are the multiplicity of the work of God in Christ. He's multiplied himself in us. Where there was one Jesus on the cross, there are multiples, uncounted children of God as a result of that, greater than that one, that one death. That's what he's talking about. Another thing that he's saying is that you individually, you get to carry on this ministry. You get to be ministers of reconciliation. You know what Christians get to be as ministers of reconciliation? We get to be the people in this world who take a broken world and bring about healing. And my challenge with seeing that is oftentimes I'm very critical of, of, of myself and other believers. I don't think we do that well enough. I don't think many of us even know that we're supposed to be that. I think many of us choose sides in this world. So we see the brokenness in the world and we take a side rather than taking the position of Christ, which is to reconcile. And I don't think I'm overcritical. I think it's just a ministry that I've been called to. As a minister of reconciliation, I've been called to the same ministry as you. We don't get to take sides. We only get to take one side, and that's the side of Christ. And so wherever there's brokenness, because we have been restored, we get to step in and show people what restoration looks like. We get to step in and show people what reconciliation looks like. In our families, in our neighborhoods, in our country, in our culture, in the world, the believer of Christ has work to do in reconciling. Because we've been reconciled to Christ. Okay. See, I told you it would be a little less than an hour and a half. <laughs> Just a little less. So what does that mean for us today? What does that mean for a church that has been here for over 100 years? What does that mean for a church which at a time in its history was one of very few churches within five miles. And now there are other churches. And you might be asking, what is our place in the world going forward? Maybe there was a time where there were more people in the pews. Maybe there was a time where there were less. Maybe there was a time where the average age was younger. Maybe you're wondering, what is God doing with us in this season? We had a minister for 17 years. We're going into a new time where God, we hope, will send us a glorious shepherd to lead us into the future. But it's a time of uncertainty, isn't it? An occasional amen helps me. <laughs> it's a time of uncertainty. And we're in it collectively. And we can't see what God may be doing. You've got to remember that scripture. You are going to do greater things. But it's conditional. You will do greater things in him if you lean into his mission in the world. If you live into that mission. It's no surprise to you. Churches come and go. I do the research. More are going than coming. But can I give you good news? The most effective churches are those that can reconcile their history with their future. Did, did, I, did I become too scholarly? Sorry. Reconcile your history with your future. Here's an illustration about that. My, work. my grandmother died at 94 years old. She was born in the 1800s. I had the very good privilege of knowing her really, really well. In fact, she was one of six children, and I knew most of them as a child. 
So most of them being born in the 1800s, I had the privilege of, of knowing them. So here's how that happened. My mother was, was one who had children in her 30s and 40s. So we were the youngest grandchildren. We were the late born grandchildren. So as a child, I got to go to this home that was passed on to them by my great grandfather, where four of my grandmother's siblings lived. They all lived there together. And at lunchtime, my school was just a few blocks away. So I was about six or seven years old. So instead of <laughs> instead of eating the lunch that my my you know the folks in my home would prepare for me in my little lunch box, eh, I would walk a few blocks and go to the home that we call the place where the old people lived. Because they cooked the best food. Their food was, was awesome compared to what was in my lunchbox. And they treated me great. I was like a golden child. But every child was like a golden child. So I, I would show up for lunch and I had a few other cousins who lived in the area and we'd all meet up for lunch. And the old people would just take care of us. How did they become my illustration today? Because of their love shown me in the very short time that I had with them, I got generations and generations of love and affection. I got generations of wisdom. I remember sitting next to my grandmother. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. You know what it's like when a grandparent just puts an arm around you? It's not a, just an arm, is it? It is the greatest love. It is the tenderest arm. Parents don't even have that, that effect. But when a grandparent does it, it just, I bet they can relate. Maybe some of you can too. So why is that an illustration of what I'm talking about in reconciliation? Because when those who are older put their arm of love around the generation behind them, instead of creating a generational divide, we bridge generations. The churches that I see that are surviving a time like this, this message is for you now, are people of my generation and yours and the ones old enough to put their arm around me are willing to do that. You want to be a part of what God is doing in this church, in this community for the next hundred years? Think about the legacy. Think about ways that you can put your arm around somebody. And it's not going to happen only on Sunday. It's going to have to happen seven days a week. They're not going to come to you on Sunday. You're going to have to go to them from Monday to Saturday. Am I making sense? I hope I am. That's what God does. That's what reconciliation feels like. That's what it feels like. It is intergenerational love. Love passed on from generation to generation. So I'm going to wrap this up by saying that God has brought you here because Jesus proclaimed it is finished. He didn't mean that it was done. And it doesn't mean that it's done for you. He was ushering in a time of jubilee, a time of great celebration, because he knew what was to come. And what was to come is you and me. This is what he was celebrating. This is what he laid out his life for, his church, his people throughout the world, and even here in Baltimore. So thank you for allowing me to celebrate with you <coughs> this time of Jubilee. Amen? <coughs> Can I pray with you one more time? Will it be up? Okay. Father God, thank you so much for this wonderful time in this wonderful place and an especially beautiful day today. We thank you for our history as a church in, in this town and in this community. We thank you for what you did 2,000 years ago on the cross, with us in mind, with me in mind, with you in mind. We thank you for so many things. We thank you that we, some of us are grandparents, some of us are parents, some of us are children who have the benefit of great love 
We pray, God, that you will, you will just entrust us with those who do not have it, those who do not have reconciliation with you. We pray that you will put the gospel in our mouths and in our hearts, and that we will see the work of Christ continuing to be done just because we know that our debt has been paid. We thank you for paying our debt on the cross. 